So let's do those, and then um, after you're done, you can just leave them kind of with your name tags at the end of the class. Here's what's going to happen today. Um, I will talk to you about presentation aids, and then I will talk to you briefly about the upcoming presentations, and then I will leave some room for questions, because this is the last time you hear from me. We're done. <laughs> the rest is guest lectures and your presentations. So if at any point today, while I'm talking, you have some questions that arise about um, structure, about presentation aids, about audience, about any of the things that I talked to you about or about any other issues that you might have with presentations, please ask me. And of course, I'm going to be here still and I'm going to have um, lectures and everything. But I'm just letting you know that as far as me, Sharing knowledge with you, we're done. That's all the knowledge I hope to share. <laughs> um, let's move, speaking of distractions, that is a good thing to notice and avoid. You hear this? I do. Um, okay. Before we move on, do you guys have any questions from the get go about structure, about what we talked about last time, about anything else? I just had a quick question and it's for you, Margaret, and the whole class. Mm -hmm. I was looking at syllabus to remind myself what we're doing today, and um, the thought just came to mind that maybe we might like to switch the order of our presentation to peers versus presentation to the general public. Um, I was just thinking maybe if we do the to peers one first, that's closer to what we're already doing in our home departments and so on, and we can get feedback from each other as to what we can understand as uh, lay people across each other's disciplines and what needs to be changed to be made more simple or more vivid or, or whatever. So just kind of throw that out there. Oh, as to... So our presentations for non-academics become better that way? I think they might. At least we learn something useful about, like, how, how much of the content is accessible to non specialists, and maybe suggestions for you know what to keep, like, oh, that graph is fabulous, it made it all clear, oh, but ditch those next five slides, they're clearly not appropriate for the general audience. Or just, yeah. That's quite better. Okay. I, see, I see where the idea is coming from, I do. That is exactly what I don't want you guys to do. Oh. I want you to prepare your presentations <laughs> with your audience very specifically in mind. I don't want you to take the presentation you already have that's prepared for academics and cut it. Uh. I want you to think completely from the scratch about talking about what you do uh. to people who don't know what you do. Okay. That was kind of the I idea behind that. it. Because remember on the last lecture and I can totally see where you're coming from because first of all it makes you work less because you have it done. Maybe not. Um, Being hard and the second thing is it seems like a good sequence. The thing is about audience certain centeredness and why I was talking so much about think who exactly you're talking to when you're preparing your presentation. I'm hoping even your structure can be different when you talk to academics versus non-academics. I'm thinking your emphasis will hopefully be completely different. Maybe even your main points will be different. Because like, for instance, when we talk about, um, I'm thinking about Begonia's research, and I'm thinking, if she talks to people who have no idea what she's doing, she's going to have to not only cut it in half, or one third, or a fifth, or however. She's going to have to change her vocabulary. She's going to have to change the way she talks about stuff, because remember, what we see when we look up is completely something different than they see, and completely, we call it different names, because we don't know 90% of the things that you are just like, oh yeah, totally, of course, I mean, you all know what it is, right? <laughs> She's gonna have to have two different presentations, and I'm hoping that's what's gonna happen with you guys, too. That you're gonna have to ask yourself kind of from a different angle, how I should talk about it if I'm talking to people who really don't know what I'm talking about. Does that make a little more sense if I'm able to like explain why yeah. <laughs> I made your life? Yeah, and I think um, my hope is that having these two presentations is 
is not, well, one thing is that you get the experience of doing the two different presentations and how to prepare them. But also that you have something that you can take and use somewhere. So you don't have this, you know, you're doing a presentation for non-academics and I'm never going to use it. But hopefully you do such a great job on it that you could then go and maybe take it to, you know, a high school in the area. Or like for me, I work out of uh, a campground, basically, and they have education programs. So maybe I could take my presentation and do it at the campground. It's like a service kind of thing for the public. So maybe keep that in mind when you're preparing it. Of like, not only you're doing it for this class, but how would you use it outside the class and make, make the most of your time? Basically. Or um, you want to be a guest lecturer at, for instance, community college, and you're talking to people who are just starting or maybe thinking about graduate school. You don't want to scare them, but you do want to present it in a way that's very accessible and at the same time very interesting. Um, that's, that's a very good example. You might want to use something that, and that hopefully will be completely different than something you will present in your department, in front of your thesis advisor, in front of, um, for a conference, in front of your peers. So it's like, I'm thinking different, completely different, different structures, maybe different main points, different approach. We don't want to hear the same presentation twice. And I'm glad you mentioned it because it's a good way to think about it too, as you guys prepare, like how to make those. It was funny, I was preparing a presentation about intercultural communication for community college. And I realized that even in communication, it's something as people-oriented as communication. We use certain words all the time that are very discipline-specific, and I had to cut them all out and check, okay, what was it when I didn't know what it really is, and I just thought about this talking to people and communicating. <laughs> How do you do that? And it, that's a challenge. It's fun to do it. Any other questions, concerns, issues, needs I could address? No? Okay, presentation aids. A few things I want to tell you about presentation aids. Um, we use them, of course, constantly. Um, what we tend to think about when we think about presentation aids is PowerPoint. I want you to remember that is not the only option. There are other things you can do that include audiovisual aids that do not include PowerPoint. Um, First and foremost thing that I want you to be prepared for when you are planning to use a presentation aid is be prepared for not using it. <laughs> because if you have a presentation with a PowerPoint that relies on this PowerPoint so heavily that if you don't have your computer, it breaks, something doesn't work, the projector doesn't turn on the switch, the cable, the adapter, the Mac versus the non-Mac, the, the whatever happened, you need to be able to say something. Besides, I'm sorry, my PowerPoint does not work. <laughs> and that's it. And I'm serious, it happens. As unlikely as we think it does, it happens all the time. Things don't work, computers don't match, adapters don't want to adapt, projectors do things. Have something to say. Besides, I'm sorry, my PowerPoint doesn't work. And this is something that I strongly encourage. Have a plan B, always. So, uh, are you going to sneak attack us and do that to us in this class? <laughs> um, it might as well happen in this class completely without my, that's usually what happens, to be honest with you. I teach public speaking, and I teach public speaking in different rooms, but most often in wellness. And there are two rooms in one that I teach, probably speaking in. And my computer always works. Always. Nothing of it. But I always tell students, be prepared, the computer might not work, blah, 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 blah. And every time, first round on informative speeches, at least three people don't get their artificial aid. I don't know. I don't know if it's aura. I don't know if it's the, the machinery that already heard me so many times that it kind of just reacts to, OK, she's yelling, we work. She's not yelling, we don't work. I don't know how it works, but I kid you not, it just doesn't work. Certain people have Macs and it doesn't work. Certain people just connect the computer and nothing happens. I don't know why. Magic. It just happens. So you know what? It might just as well happen, and I'm not going to have to do anything. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> But no, be prepared for it, because it really does happen. And I witnessed it plenty of time. Um, and 
if you have this one opportunity, this one conference, this one presentation, this one time to do it, you better be prepared to do it. Um, so whatever you need, is it you need to print your slides, or you need to have an outline, or you need to be able to explain things, and hopefully you will be able to deliver your presentation without saying, so here I would show you this thing I'm not going to show you, which would be really cool and would help you, but I don't have it. Because that's not very <laughs> helpful. So try to have a plan B. And this also might be a very good thing for you to deal with your um, apprehension. If you know that worse comes to worse, you're still prepared. That is a very good, another little technique to make yourself feel less anxious. Because if you know that you're prepared, even if things don't work, that makes you feel that extra cushion. That makes you feel extra, um, a little more secure, hopefully. Make sense? OK. Second thing. I love when that happens. And I know you've been there, and I know you've seen it plenty of times. The person talks to the PowerPoint, and they're talking and talking and talking. And, talking. and then PowerPoint is not showing, or it's showing something completely different. Or uh, there's a fire going on in the back of the room, and they don't notice. Because they don't look at their audience. They look at their PowerPoint. And I, this is not a joke. I mean, it's funny now, but this is not a joke. I was, I witnessed the presentation when something started burning in the no. back of the room and people started leaving and the guy didn't notice. Because he was talking to his PowerPoint. I kid you not. The guy was standing reading off his PowerPoint and people started leaving the room and he didn't notice. Don't talk to your PowerPoint. I know you're very proud of it, and you have a very intimate relationship with your PowerPoint. It's a great <laughs> PowerPoint, and you spend a lot of time preparing it. Don't talk to it. Talk to your audience. Because nothing makes worse impression than a person who does this. So now we're going to be talking about my PowerPoint that I wrote and I really like. So I'm not going to look at you ever, and I'm going to read off my PowerPoint. After about 45 seconds of that, you're done. You have no connection with me. We have no eye contact. You don't listen to me. I mean, we all can read. We're in grad school, man. If you really think that everything that you really have to say or present can be written on it, then don't bother. Well, for some reason, we're up there. This is very important. And this is not only for PowerPoint. It's for the board, the poster. Basically, don't talk to it. Talk to your audience. Remember that your audiovisual aid is not for you. It's for the people who you talk to. In his defense, it was a fairly big room. The room where things started burning. So maybe it would be a while before he would smell it. But literally, anyway, be careful. The other thing, when you think about your audiovisual aid, why do you think people use audiovisual aids? Why do we have PowerPoints and presentations? Because a lot of things are easier to explain in a paragraph than the paragraphs of talking. And yet, how often do you see people have paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs on their slides? Mm -hmm. Why? Again, we're in college, we can read. Why do we use PowerPoint then? No, seriously, like why why? Why do you have artificial aids in presentations? Personally I don't want to use power. Because me neither. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I, I sometimes use it because it's, I have to. Mm -hmm. And if I um, if I have an option to use or not, I, I do I prefer not to use it. Are there certain things that are better explained with an audiovisual aid? I think it's to explain it's more of structuring of your um, of your your talk and and the audience too. Mm -hmm. Another way to clarify uh, what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That's true. And another way of communicating. What about stuff like numbers, percentages, proportions? It helps to have a graph for it. Now, does it mean in, in the sense of graphs and what, what having something visual to look at as far as thinking, okay, 
I, I almost took a question the other way around at first. Like, what occasions do you not really require a presentation aid to make it better? I mean, you do storytelling. You, you cut, you know, the folk singer or whatever who's telling a story, and it's part of the point of it to have the audience use their imaginations. And then I'm thinking, eh, we could maybe occasionally do that in something science or, or whatever. You know, imagine the first galaxy, and it's whatever. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like, if you're trying to picture, you know, okay, we're studying the ancient culture of Croatia, and there's hills and valleys and rice farms or whatever, um, that's fine if, if what's required is just an impression or a general idea of a landscape or something. If you really need to show exactly how the curve goes, there's nothing to replace it. You don't want your audience using their mentioning soon on your Yeah. Even if you could absolutely accurately explain what you got going on. Look at what happened. I asked you a question about audiovisual aids, and three examples you gave me were physical pictures of something. It's easier to see something if we have a picture of it. Structuring our presentation and visualizing certain concepts, like graphs or like proportions. Now that we've established that these are all three good reasons to use an audiovisual aid, think about audiovisual aids that you've seen people use and that you use. How little do they have in common with these three purposes? Why people feel the need to write their presentations on the slide? Why? Is it relevant? Does it show a picture? Does it show a graph? Or does it show structure? No, it doesn't show either. It makes you feel better. That's not the point of audiovisual aid. I want you to think about your audiovisual aid very, in a very utilitarian way. Am I using it? Do I need it? Does it help my presentation? Because if it doesn't, don't put it there. Because it doesn't make sense. Really. And I understand that in some contexts you feel like, okay, I'm going to show up there without a PowerPoint. That's not going to be professional. That's not going to make sense. They're not going to understand me. Have you understood me so far? Is that a fairly professional college setting? Am I talking to you about serious stuff? Do you know what I'm talking to you about? <laughs> Have I used PowerPoint once? We're good. We managed. I didn't have to put every single thing I say on a slide, and you still got it. Really, I mean, just break free from the, <laughs> basically, from the horrible PowerPoint um, pressure. Because that's what we do. We, we think that we cannot go out there in front of people if we don't have a We can't. It's okay, really. It happens actually sometimes. Now that you start from this point, because this is the point I want you to start with. I want you to start from the point where there is no PowerPoint. And then, as you build your presentation and you think about your audiovisual aid, I want you to put things on your PowerPoint that are relevant and that are needed there and that you feel will increase the quality and relevance of your presentation. That's the way to think about your presentation aids. What is there that I need to help my audience see it better, understand it better, remember it better? Three main reasons for using all the visual aids that are usually mentioned in public presentation is clarity, retention, and interest. If your audiovisual aid doesn't serve one of these three purposes, it's irrelevant. If it doesn't help your audience understand things better that could not be understood, and this is what Josh was talking about, graphs, um, uh, proportions, percent, flow of things is great. Audiovisual aids are great for those. When you show cycles, or when you show change, or when you show fit any um, rise or fall of a trend or of a percentage, things changing over time. That's, that's great. Retention, that's what Gloria was talking about. Structuring the presentation. What helps your audience remember the presentation and remember where they are in the presentation? That's very important. That's where retention comes in. And finally, interest. What makes this presentation less boring? Every now and then, it's good 
to use your audiovisual link to trigger your audience's interest. As in, um, if you talk about something that you think might not be very fascinating or might sound boring if you don't show it, think about some use of audiovisual link that can make it maybe a little more dramatic. You can even do it with a graph if you think about it. Okay, I'm telling you that in 1999, um, 800,000 people had cell phones in the US. And then in 2009, which is 10 years later, um, 50 million people have cell phones in the US. And I'm telling you that. And you're hearing what I'm saying, okay. But if I do this, that's very clear. And that will make you remember, wow, seriously, that's a big change. If you make this graph go from this point to that point, and you can do it in PowerPoint, very likely. There you go. Look what happened. You're going to remember that. That's going to create some interest. All these three were mentioned by you. And all these three are relevant reasons to use um, audiovisual aids. If you don't need it for one of these reasons, don't put it in. Um, once you decided to put it in there, because you feel better and you need it and you want your PowerPoint, uh, there are a few things that are very important that I almost, I don't want you to feel like I'm oversimplifying it for you, but those are very important things. Make sure your audiovisual aid is visible for everyone. If you have audio, make sure everyone can hear it. If you have pictures or um, a video or something that you're going to enlarge on a big screen, make sure the definition is high enough for us to be able to see it. Those are silly things, but they make sense. If you're giving, for instance, a presentation at a conference, sometimes think that things that at our computer screen look just fine, if you blow them up to a size that allows people in the room to see them, the resolution becomes just so crappy that you can barely see what's on the screen. That's an important thing to remember. The other thing to remember, if you're showing something, if you're in a smaller room, let's say, and you're showing a graph or you're showing a, something that you're physically holding, don't do this, as you can clearly see, because Josh can't clearly see. He can't see anything if I do this. And people do that sometimes. They would show a model, for instance, and they would put this model over here. As you can clearly see in my model, and then you can, but you can't, you can't even see my model. Those are important. Think about those. Those um, reasons are why I sometimes mention if you have the opportunity, check the room out first. Because for instance, if you have, and in some sciences, models are really important. You show models, you use them. Make sure you can display them clearly. Make sure people can see them. Make sure um, you know how to kind of place yourself around it to don't get in the way or anything like that. Um, if you're using something that, um, is very dynamic or very colorful. Make sure that it is understandable. Sometimes people do overload. Oh, I'm going to do bright green with orange and blah. And then at the end of it, you just end up with a screen filled with color, but you still don't understand what's going on. Um, those are really important. Those are important to remember. Those are important to keep in mind as you're preparing for your presentation. Finally, which I mentioned at the very beginning, but I again want you to remember it. Your audiovisual aid isn't for you. It's not for you. Don't make your PowerPoint your outline. I strongly encourage you to either have your notes on the side of your slideshow, which is possible, or have your notes underneath your um, slides but they don't show on the screen or have an outline in hand because your what's showing here is not for you. People who listen to you don't care how you got there. They are interested in why they are seeing it. If it's only for you, put it on your outline. Put it next to it. Don't, you see what I'm saying? 
this is very important and this is why people read their powerpoints because they prepare their powerpoints for themselves so then they need them to figure out where they are that's not how it works this is for you not for me if i need to remember that this is clarity retention and interest i'm going to write it over here i'm not going to say oh what is okay so clarity why is it important oh okay finally Besides looking awkward and not noticing that the room's on fire, it takes your credibility away. Because if you have to read your own PowerPoint, subconsciously what people are thinking is like, okay, why? Do you not know what you're talking about? Because if you need to read it, then why do you need to read it? Aren't you the one who wrote it? You know what's there, right? Um, the other reason why not to write everything on your PowerPoint is why are you there? If they can read it all. Make yourself relevant. Make your audience pay attention to you. Because if you provide everything for them, then why then just go home? Just put your PowerPoint and go. Because if we don't need it, you then what what's the point of the whole thing? You have to have certain information that comes from you and only from you. Because that's why you're there. That's why we're interested in you, not your PowerPoint. Two more things I want to mention. First, if you have slides um, and you have outlines separately, include change of slides in your outline. That's an important thing to remember. Include your ABA, your audiovisual aid, whatever it is, in your outline for yourself. So you know when you need to change a slide. So you know when you're going to move from here to here and, for instance, work with a model. Sometimes when we get very stressed out, we forget what is supposed to be accompanying what we're talking. What I it happened to me at least several times when in my public speaking class when I tell students prepare your power, your audiovisual aid and practice with it. What people would do is they would hear my lecture about we don't have to have PowerPoints. So for instance, they would prepare a poster. It's a very nice poster. They come out, they put their poster. Very good, visible, large, everything's good. Okay. And then they deliver their entire speech. And they deliver, 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 and then they're done and they're like, And I kid you not, it happens at least two times every quarter. <laughs> because if you don't practice with your audiovisual aid, you don't remember your hand there. And people forget about it constantly. So include it in your outline. If you have something that you need to do, change, switch, include it in your outline. And finally, you know how when you're drifting and you're kind of sitting in a presentation and you think, wow, that's really boring. Um, or it's not really boring, it's like, it's kind of irrelevant, or whatever, I know they're aware. What do you do? You read the slides of the person that's behind them. Or they talk about this part of the slide, and they talk and talk and talk, but you've already looked at this one and this one, and you've read all these little notes that they have here, and you've read all these little notes, and then you thought, ooh, that's kind of a cool little corner here. I wonder where there's an ornament. I like that. I wonder if I could do that for my TA class. And then you're thinking, that purple kind of looks really weird, maybe they would go with green. And you've done all that already. Well, if you want your audience not to do that, show the things that you talk about only when you talk about them. Don't show things you don't talk about, and don't talk about things you're not showing. So for instance, I, I know it sounds confusing. For instance, if you talk about an elephant, a zebra, and an Squirrel. <laughs> when you talk about an elephant, have a picture of an elephant. And don't say, in a minute we're, talking, we're going to be talking about zebra. So zebra, no. What are you showing elephant? Talk about elephant. <laughs> Done talking about elephant, we're switching to a zebra, and we have a zebra in the picture. Once you have a zebra in the picture, don't say, oh, by the way, about elephants. So the other thing, no, 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 no. We're done with elephants. We're on zebras right now. What happens if you want to say something between a zebra and a squirrel? Do you leave a zebra or do you go for a squirrel? You have a blank slide. Put a slide in between a zebra and a squirrel. If you need one, 
because you're talking about something that's not zebra related, not yet squirrel related, but important to put in the middle, then put a blank slide. So you have your zebra, you have a visual break for them when they're not looking at your zebra and they're not ready for a squirrel yet, and then you move on to the next thing. No, it sounds silly, but I'm serious. It's like confusing very often because people, that's what people would do. Your audience would go ahead of you. If you show them the slide, they're going to read it. If you show them something that you're not talking about yet, of course they're going to be reading it. No, they're not going to be listening to you. Why? Ooh, there's something new. Think about this. Don't be afraid to turn your PowerPoint off for a second. If you're done with this section, before you move on to this section, put it on the screen. It's perfectly acceptable. I wanted to ask the thing about the blank screen. It's also good because it kind of gets people out of this PowerPoint hypnosis where they're <laughs> looking at the PowerPoint and they never look at you. And if you put a blank screen in the app, they're like, oh, I forgot, this person is talking. So it's That's a great, great point, absolutely, yeah. And, and that's, that's a great point, what Margaret just said, because you're there, and they forget you're there. If you are completely and utterly here, they really forget that they're listening to you. They're listening to your PowerPoint. That's, that's, or that's a great point. Put a picture of our souls between two brothers. <laughs> 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 I was thinking I put an arrow. No, no. <laughs> On it. So basically, like if your PowerPoint is, I don't know, green, okay. just that's one way to go about it. And the second way to go about it, and I'm glad you mentioned it, because it makes it more conversational, more natural, is you can totally tell. Let me now address something else, or let me just talk about, and you just put it up there, and you address it in a way that lets them know we don't need it right now. You can even say, okay, let's forget about PowerPoint for a second. Continue, and then you can go back to your site. So there are several things to do it. You can, and I would say, why not? Absolutely, make a little joke about it, you know? Or, or comment on it somehow to let them know, I know what I'm doing, hello! <laughs> or, which is very important, because people tend to assume that like, oh, no power, but something happened. Or, have it like in the theme of your PowerPoint, but just with no um, content. <coughs> Another good way to do that is to change where you are in the room. So okay. a lot of times you get kind of locked into like I'm standing on the side of my screen and talking about it. And 
then when you have a blank screen, it gives you a chance to kind of walk in front of the screen and kind of move around a bit more. <coughs> Again, you're still presenting and you know what you're doing, you're yeah, just kind of, mm -hmm. yeah. So my hunch is that if you if you have a template for your slide, or, or if it's even just white, if you blank it to black, it would be something, like it, wouldn't, it would it'd give the impression that this is an intentional change, and not like a slide that they have left empty. Okay, that makes sense. Also, PowerPoint, when you are presenting, you can press the point, and the screen will be black. So then you, you you can approach to your computer, press the point, and say, well, um, what's talked about this? I don't know. Yeah, you can kind of make it visible that you're turning it off. That's another yeah, that you're switching. That's another way to approach it. Absolutely. Sometimes you can just because on those machines you have these things where you can switch the what is visible to the audience. Yeah, you can make it point like. One thing I always find effective is if people at the beginning have an outline, maybe three points you're going to talk about, and then when they finish one point, they just show that next point on the next screen. So, you know, now that's coming. Like, let's say you talk about three things. Uh -huh. First, you talk about number one, and then before you switch to number two, you just put up the title of number two, basically, on the, on the oh. next screen, and that will give you an opportunity to like talk freely free for a while before you go into it. Yeah, that's a good thing too if you have like labels kind of like if you have um, the main point and it has sub points, yeah. you can just put your main point on the screen and just talk about your sub points. Yeah, that, that might be a good idea too. Another question. Uh -huh. So you said that PowerPoint isn't always necessary, but I'm wondering um, it kind of goes back to the, the point that we made earlier that if you don't have a PowerPoint, you seem maybe less professional or less prepared. So to kind of bridge that gap, what other kind of visual aids would you bring in instead of a PowerPoint? Because whenever I think of doing like a poster instead, I get that image of like, oh, this is High school. third grade, or <laughs> something, yeah, third grade book report, and I had fun with my glue stick, and yeah. I feel like that's not professional either. Well, think about our first guest lecture. She didn't have a PowerPoint. She had a hangout for us with sure. a structure of her presentation. If you have a small enough audience, that might be a way to go. Um, what else? Always feel free to use a board. I feel like that gives structure too. And that's really good if you create things as you go. Like if you want to show a certain progression or if you want to end up with a structure. Like what we did last time with the structure. The board, I felt, was a good use of audiovisual aid this last time because I was kind of talking about the zebras as I went, and then we ended up with the structure on the board. So if you have the opportunity to use the board, that might be a good idea. Sometimes um, you don't need an actual PowerPoint presentation even though you can use your computer. For instance, if you talk about your research and you need a table because you have your results, you don't have to have five slides. You can have a slide with your results, and that's it. It still shows people you have your results and you have all your P's and whatever you need, the statistical significance in the um, And they still see that you know what you're talking about, but you don't physically need to kind of like build up on it. That's, that's sometimes what people do too, and I feel like, you don't need, you know? But, um, Absolutely feel free to like use your computer too and, and, and even have a, a, a picture of your, or your results or table or whatever you need. But a board, sometimes like our first presenter did, she had a little handout for us. Um, I use the board constantly. I don't like PowerPoint, PowerPoint. I, it's just, uh, I don't absolutely necessarily have to. Yeah, uh, I don't know if it is a good way to use the, the laser pointer because sometimes I feel it is necessary, but sometimes it is a little bit distracting for me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know if there is a good way to use the laser pointer. It depends. What I would hesitate to answer their question, this question in a very yes or no fashion because it so much depends on the content. Like, I can imagine some scientific presentations where they're showing things on the model or in space where it really matters where we look at, and it's very important for us to, 
to be looking at exactly what the speaker is showing us. And obviously, a laser pointer in that case is better than me being, so here, on my slide, because the, absolutely. Um, at the same time, I agree with you. Sometimes it's an overload. Sometimes people would use a laser pointer to point to their PowerPoint. I'm thinking, okay, I can see your power, you know? Really, it's on the wall there. And I can even figure out which paragraphs you're reading. Woo! Um, so yeah, sometimes it's, it's kind of an overload. So I would say just go as you, like, kind of go back to this. If it's gonna help them, if it's something that will really help your audience, know exactly where you are. If it's a necessary, why? Why put an extra? Um, I, I noticed that something I like when you have to like point out something like that is rather than like having like a laser pointer like jittering all over the screen, is if you know you're gonna talk about it next, um, you duplicate that slide and then you just have like a circle, a red circle or something. Like that. That's, that's always a good one, that is true. You can just point to it or you can have a circle or you can, yeah. That's, that's a, sometimes what people do is they um, take a part, they have a slide with a general picture or map or something, and then they just take a part, enlarge it, and that's their next slide. That's sometimes a good way, too. And I, I figure that out by when I'm practicing, am I pointing at my screen? Um, and, and one way that I do it is I do it over the phone with my mom, where we both have the PowerPoint presentation, and then I give my presentation to her over the phone. And I come up with, am I having to stop and be like, oh, are you looking at this part of the slide? And that's where I figure out, like, oh, I need to draw attention to that, you know, use a police printer, or what you said. Yeah. So, again, just practicing and figuring out where you can do that. What a nice one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, if I'm giving a presentation where I'm supposed to be showing, like, uh, diagnostics, like how to identify a beetle, or like identify certain like signs of disease, then if I gave a handout that wasn't necessarily following what I was talking about, should I do that after the presentation? Because then they're just gonna be reading it, or should I make a new um, piece of paper, like a handout, a new handout for them to look at while I'm talking? This is a very good question. Where to include your handout if you need one? Because the problem is, if you give the handout before the presentation, they're going to read it. Um, if you give the handout in the middle of presentation, there's going to be this like, oh, am I getting it? Oh, is it rolls over. And, and then you lose the attention again. If there is a way for you to do it, sometimes it's best to not give a handout, present what you're talking about, and say, I'm going to give you this handout at the end of the presentation, so don't worry, you don't have to write everything down. You go through the process and then you give them the actual graph or, or table or something that helps them do it when they need to identify or go through the process or, or classify or whatever you were talking about. Sometimes this works. Then you can just be like, I'm gonna give you this at the end of the presentation, so let's just take a look at this and then I'm gonna Sometimes what works is if you have enough time to give the handout like five minutes before the presentation, you can do it and then from the beginning say, the handout I gave you will not be relevant until the second part of my presentation or until I get there. That kind of gives people a clue like, okay, I don't need it right now. So if you can, that's sometimes a good idea. If you have a small audience, you can risk passing the handout in your presentation because it's not going to take long. Because if you have five, eight people, it's not going to take long to pass it even while you're talking when you're ready for it. That's a tough one though. It's, it's a good question because the way I would answer it is think about the way to do it that would get in the way of your presentation the least. Again, communicative orientation. What will facilitate my message the best? Do I want them to look at it because this is crucial? Do I want them to focus on this because this is crucial? Or is it really, really important and necessary that they have a piece of paper in front of them when I talk about it? Because if so, then maybe I can sac sacrifice 45 seconds of their attention, but to make sure that everyone has a paper. That's kind of how I would approach it. 
Think about your message and what's the most important thing in it. The picture that they can follow and then relate, or the paper in front of them, or the can they wait till the end, or is it very important that they start with it? Sometimes if you want to, you can start with your handout, if you can. That's a good thing to do too. If you really need to hand it out, start with it. They're looking at it anyway. So if you can. Do you guys have any other questions about anything else? No? Do you feel like a little more ready to resolve certain issues or address some things that might be helpful in the future? Structure-wise or PowerPoint-wise. So I've always, I always wonder <clears throat> if I'm putting too much information in the PowerPoint and not enough information. Sometimes people read the PowerPoint. Sometimes they don't read it, but they put a bunch of stuff up. So I can't concentrate on it and look at the PowerPoint at the same time. I mean, so it's confusing. But I think if I look at what you've told us today, that if um, these people with these, you know, all this wishy-washy stuff, well, I don't know what to do. This should make it clear. If I don't, if the audience doesn't need it. Because if, if that's what happens when you talk about the situation when people put stuff on PowerPoint and then talk about something else, that's not following the talk about right. things you're showing, don't talk about things you're not showing, and don't show things that you're not talking about. Right. Because that's, of course, people are not going to be, that's irrelevant. I don't even know why people do it. And it's true, people do it sometimes. Why? Do you seriously expect us to be able to read and listen and pay attention to both? Do you have an extra head for us to do that? Because I, I don't know how to do it with what. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's an overload. Uh, how much simple has to do with the background? Because sometimes when you, it's a one slide with only black letters, mm -hmm. I, you know what? This is how I'm going to address that. This actually talks about it in detail. And I feel like they do a good job because they talk about stuff like pastel colors are better for backgrounds. Sharper colors are better for that. And they address a lot of technical stuff like that that I kind of didn't want to go into because I knew that this is what they're covering in part. But the, the general rule is the pastel colors work better for backgrounds and make an impression like you put some work in. Um, I think Fernando, our guest speaker on Thursday, is going to cover that as well. He's going to talk about you know what fonts are great to use, uh, what what colors are good, what colors aren't good, and then he's also going to be teaching us in the computer lab how to actually use PowerPoint and, and the equivalents of it. So we're going to have a lot more. And I feel like I didn't really want to get into, that's why I wasn't really technical with you guys, because we're going to have a person who's, I'm looking forward to learning from. I'm just so excited. <laughs> My PowerPoint will be so much better. <laughs> um, and I didn't want to, by any means, overstep it. And I feel like for me, it's more important that you kind of hear about the actual why. <laughs> and then we're going to hear from Fernando about how and all the aspects of how. And so where do we meet on Thursday? Um, we here? here. Yeah. Or not the computer yeah. lab? Or you said something about a computer lab. No, the computer lab is the week after, and I'll send out an email to remind you all. But yeah, the, the Thursday we're meeting here. I'm, I'm so looking forward to it. Because I'm always a little embarrassed about my car. My car is so very nice. Okay. I know I have to have one. Um, please leave your consent forms if you guys are done. And yeah.